Good evening, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. So here's an overview of the following webinars. Today, we will be starting with uh, the one that's uh, selected in red, the introduction, why they are, what they are, why and when to use arts. And here's uh, the group of uh, different institutions that are gonna be collaborating throughout the webinar series. And we would like to thank them ahead. So let's start today with um, our webinar. So uh, to give you a little bit of an overview of the situation as of 2021, uh, we have an estimated this uh, number of described species of around 8,309. Uh, from those, 7,212 have been evaluated and 2,442 are threatened. So we have an estimated percentage of, percentage of threatened species between 34 to 51%. Uh, and why is this range? Because we have 1,184 data deficient species. So we don't exactly know where they, where they stand. So according to our last uh, species conservation needs assessment uh, that's available since 2012 published by Johnson et al, from the 29 countries that participated in this assess assessment, 212 species require ex situ management uh, for survival, to ensure survival. So we know that there are many countries that did not participate in the assessment. So probably there's much more um, than 212 species that require this. Um, for 2017, we already had uh, 536 species reported. Um, requiring captivity or to be in captive survival assurance colonies, which is um, the new name that CVPs are um, using from now on. Uh, from, the, from those 246 uh, were located in zoos and 290 in facilities different to zoos. This doesn't mean that the ones in zoos are more threatened. They were act actually found equally threatened both uh, in zoos and out of zoos. So what is, what is the primary goal of a captive, captive survival assurance colony? Basically to maintain a, a self-sustainable population that is reliably reproductive. Um, and for that, we need reproductive success. So what do we mean by reproductive success in amphibians? Well, uh, it's a complex process that involves spermiation, egg maturation, spawning, fertilization, embryonic development and metamorphosis. So we need to accomplish all those phases to claim we have reproductive success. And one of the primary obstacles that CSCs face, usually it's impaired reproduction. So here's when we introduce mitigating tools that include either reproductive technologies such as ultrasound and hormone monitoring or artificial reproductive technologies, such as hormonal simulation, artificial fertilization, cryopreservation, and intra intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. So we're, we'll look uh, a little bit into those. Uh, in, in the webinar series, uh, you'll look at this in detail. So today we're, we're just gonna pass over them. And if you have questions, uh, remember that at the end, we'll have a Q&A uh, session. So let's start with what are arts or artificial reproductive technologies. So this is a set of tools that will help us improve the management and reproduction uh, success in a captive colony. And these are alternative solutions to improve the reproduction of a given species in captivity if natural reproduction doesn't happen or is impaired. But for this, uh, we, uh, this, uh, Techniques, techniques needs to be developed uh, in a species specific manner. And for this, we need to understand a little bit uh, of the evolutionary history of the species, the physiological variations, hormonal, hormonal cycles and reproductive strategies and modes. There's a lot of information that's been already published. And in many cases, these protocols have been replicated exactly as been as and they have been published for other species to a new species. So we don't recommend that uh, because probably we're missing a lot of information there. Um, so we recommend to take this as a reference or as a guide while developing your own species specific 
uh, protocol. So as I mentioned before, uh, we're, we'll, we're going to go into these arts one by one and see a little bit of the detail of, uh, of one of these, of each, uh, for in the next uh, slide. So in the pictures here, we have some examples. For example, here you have hormonal simulation on uh, Atelopusiteki, the Panamanian golden frog, all the way to sperm collection. We have a, a picture of ICSI, uh, artificial fertilization and cryopreservation in nitrogen liquid, liquid nitrogen tanks. So for horm hormonal simulation, which is kind of the first step to develop arts. So what is this? This is uh, the use or application of exogenous hormones to promote gamete production and to facilitate gamete collection and or to simulate reproductive behavior. Uh, there, there are some hormones available. Uh, the most utilized ones are the gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist, GnRHA, uh, formerly known as LHRH, uh, luteinizing hormone releasing hormone, but nowadays uh, it should be referred to as GnRH. And for amphibians, um, we use the mammalian agonist, which is the one that has the best compatibility with the receptors in amphibians. Then we have the human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, HCG, and then combinations of GnRHA and dopamine antagonists, such as methylcopramide, domperidone, and pimoside. So there are different ways to administer these uh, treatments, the hormones. We have injection, which is uh, usually the best working method. And this can be accomplished uh, in three different uh, ways via intraperitoneal intra injection, subcutaneous, or intramuscular. We recommend using uh, a volume of injection of 10 microliters per gram of body weight uh, so we don't alter the internal osmotic balance of the uh, animal. Then we have topical, oral, and nasal dripping. Topical, usually, it's either uh, sitting the, the frog or toad in a water bath with diluted hormones, oral ingestion, usually injecting um, crickets or food with hormones and feed then uh, the animals with it. And nasal dripping is basically uh, putting some drops of hormones diluted in water in the nasal cavity. So usually uh, there's been success reported for all these methods. Nevertheless, the one with, as I already mentioned, uh, best results is injections, because usually you, you get the absorption of the hormonal concentration uh, that you actually have, are aiming for. Um, versus the other three, you don't know exactly how much is being lost or not absorbed by the animal. So you lose control of the, con the actual concentration that's been absorbed. Then, um, as we mentioned before, uh, this needs to be uh, Develop in a, or standardize in a species specific manner. So you'll have a series of, of steps to follow while developing a protocol for hormonal simulation for males and for females. Some steps uh, will, uh, will coincide between the two and some will be different. Let's start with uh, males for a sperm collection. So first you need to uh, select the hormones that you're gonna use. Here you can rely on already published information, um, if you have related species that's been uh, worked on or you have been worked on, you have kind of a standard or guide to start from. And then the concentrations of those hormones that you're gonna use. After that, then you need to select the, the administration method. Uh, so either injection, topical, oral injection, nasal dripping. And after that, then you determine the post-stimulation collection time points. Usually, uh, it's recommended to start collecting um, samples uh, 30 minutes post injection and from there one hour all the way to uh, 12 to 24 hours and then you can then uh, have higher like longer periods of collection until you see no response. Then uh, the collection method for sperm you can have as you see in the picture for Atelopus limosus down here. Uh, collection with catheter inserted in the cloaca. So for uh, bicapillarity, the, the spermicurion will flow 
to either a Petri dish or a, an, an appender tube, or you can massage um, the abdominal area of the frog and then that will stimulate sometimes urination. But for that, you need to make sure you have a container uh, to collect the sample because it, it can go, you know, it, it can be a higher high power <laughs> urine um, stream and, and then you can lose some sample. Then uh, you need to go for, uh, by the process of uh, assessment of quality and viability. And this first firm includes evaluating for each of the time points, uh, the motility, forward progressive motility, osmolarity of the sample, which is really important, pH, then you can do, or you should do morphology assessment and viability assessments such as life and death staining or um, DNA uh, fragmentation assessment. And uh, as a result, at the end, you have uh, the identification of the production peaks. These are the time points where, where you get the highest concentrated samples and the highest uh, quality samples. For females, so we share steps one and two, where you select the hormones, the concentrations, and select the administration method. Then for this, uh, for females, it's a little bit more complicated because when you're starting from scratch with a species, you don't know if this species will um, actually lay eggs after one dose or if it will require priming doses. A priming dose is a kind of a preparatory dose, a lower dose that's given prior to the ov ovulatory dose, which is a higher dose. So you need to test uh, first with ov ovulatory doses, and if you don't get any result, then try priming doses. And usually you need to do some different combinations of hormones and doses. So it's a little bit more complicated for females, but it can be done. Then you need to identify the response time, which is kind of different from, uh, from males. Males usually respond after hours or minutes of uh, simulations. Simulation then females will usually respond uh, up to 24, all the way to five, five, five or 10 days after stimulation. And that depends if you're using a priming dose or not. So then you need to determine collection method. For females, uh, you can do stripping, which is uh, kind of inserting a cannula in the quaca and helping the female lay the eggs or by massaging the abdominal area or either wait for the female to uh, lay the eggs by herself. And the last um, step for females will be assessing the egg quality and viability. For, for the eggs is a little more uh, simple than for sperm. Then this usually in, includes a, a visual assessment of the quality of the egg. And uh, you can also do fixing and morphology, uh, fixing some of the eggs. And, on, and this will allow, allow you to understand if there are different, how many uh, jelly layers the species has and what's the internal morphology for the species. So here there is an, uh, an example of Progaster Evanesco, <coughs> sorry, being injected, uh, hormonally simulation, stimulated by the injection. Sorry, applications. So what do you need hormonal stimulation for? Uh, you can use it for uh, synchronizing reproductive events. Uh, for uh, obtaining gametes for artificial fertilization, for cryopreservation, or ICSI, or the applica application of ICSI. So here are some examples at Panama Amphibian Rescue and Conservation Project that we have been working on. Here's five species of uh, the genus Atelopus, Atelopus glyphus, various Seteki, which is the Panamanian golden frog, Limosus, and Certus. So this will be the last step after all the ones that I show you before, the determination of the collection peaks after trying six different treatments on Atelopus eteki, Panamanian golden frog. As you can see, there were th three different concentrations of GnRH that were tried and two of HCG and Amphiplex, which is a cocktail of GnRH A and methylcopramide, which is a, a dopamine antagonist. For these species, uh, and you can see this, it, it will depend on the species. This is why it's so important to uh, standardize this in a sp 
species specific manner. You'll see some of them have one peak or two peaks over time, and you'll be able to see which ones work better. In the case of the Panamanian golden frog, we can see that four micrograms per gram of GnRH and Amphiplex, uh, these are the ones that work better. better. Uh, GnRH uh, A at four micrograms uh, elicited a response right away, uh, 30 minutes after, uh, after stimulation. And Amphiplex actually was the one that elicited a, a higher concentrated uh, response on, uh, in the sample. So for this species, we consider either using Amphiplex as a first option or four micrograms per gram GnRH as a second option. Nevertheless, all the hormones actually um, elicited a response in this species. So for another example, we have Atelopus limosus. Uh, this is, was developed for, by one of my students, uh, Dionel. Uh, here we have three different concentrations of GnRH at the top, two of HCG, and then Amphiplex again. So for this species, even though they're like really close, re closely related, we have GnRH two micrograms working better than the other two GnRH uh, concentrations, and again Amphiplex. So Amphiplex seems to work very good on the genus Atelopus. So to give you an example. This is well. This is uh, what you want to 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 accomplish at the end of uh, the development of a, a hormonal stimulation protocol. Here you can tell, for example, the time points uh, post stimulation versus concentration. You'll see when to stimulate the. You'll know when to stimulate the 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 male to get uh, when to collect the the sample. Sorry, after you stimulate to get the best sample possible for the species. If you don't know this, you'll be kind of blind and you'll probably get a sample that's not the best you could have collected and used for other purposes. For example, for cryopreservation, we need highly concentrated samples. If you were to collect, for example, 20, 21 hours post-injection using four, grams per, uh, per gra four micrograms per gram of uh, GnRH, you will lose the window of having collected a, a really good sample in the hours prior. So this is how a sample of uh, Seteki, Pan uh, Panamanian golden frog sperm looks like. This is a hormonally stimulated sample. This is what we would call 100% motility and 100% uh, forward progressive motility as well. Then other species that we're working on uh, here are two completely different uh, unrelated species to uh, the Atelopus genus. This is Strabomantis buponiformis and Crowgaster evanesco. These are direct developers and they have terrestrial reproduction mode. For these guys, for example, evanesco is an endemic species of Panama recently described uh, in 2010. So there's little information on species out there. So we started developing the protocol. This was developed by one of other student of mine, Gineska Otero. She's working on uh, developing the protocol for C. Evanesco. And as you can tell, well, we have the three concentrations of GnRH, two, four, and six. And then we have two concentrations of HCG and Amphiplex again. So these species, contrary to Atelopus, will not uh, respond to HTG or poorly, poorly respond. So this indicates that probably we need to try a higher concentration of HCG because for um, 10 international units per gram, we, we got a response, but it was kind of very, very small response. On the contrary, we, ha we, we, we can see that uh, GnRH4, well, at least it's a very rapid response that goes down quick, well, after probably six hours of simulation. And then we have another peak uh, after 24 hours. So for this species, it is really interesting because uh, all the way to 48 hours, we'll, we'll, see, we'll still have a response. And amphiplex, well, it's also good 
But for this species, for example, after uh, analyzing all the data, we will recommend using uh, four micrograms per gram of GnRH in a window of uh, half an hour all the way to probably three hours post injection to get a good sample. And what do I mean by a good sample? This is how it looks. There's approximately between seven and eight million cells per ml. So it's really concentrated and it's a really, what we, we call a really good sample. So for um, the boreal toad, so we have uh, some progress on uh, the hormonal, the hormonal protocols being developed. And in this graph, you only see HCG because there were some tests uh, done prior with HCG and there was kind of a um, more or less response. So, so, so they, they, they went ahead and treated uh, and explored HCG and different concentrations. So you'll see different patterns here, for example, for uh, three international units of HCG, you will see uh, all of them will have some response to our supposed stimulation, but this uh, lower concentration will have a peak after seven hours post injection. Um, nevertheless, the uh, concentration in the middle, 10 international units per gram, will have a higher response uh, quicker and it'll go and it'll drop over time. Same thing as with 15, uh, it'll start, you have a peak probably three hours post stimulation. So this way you can, for this species, uh, you will choose either using 10 or 15 international units uh, per gram of body weight. So another application uh, for hormonal simulation is uh, to synchronize uh, assisted natural breeding what we call assisted natural breeding. And this will be simulating the male, the female, putting them together and uh, waiting for them to reproduce. So you will require uh, an already developed hormonal simulation protocol prior to this. So you understand when the male uh, produces the best sample, when the female lays the eggs after simulation and putting them together to, uh, and hope to, to get the best results. So as I mentioned already, we need to understand when the hormones kick, uh, kick in for each of the sexes uh, and we'll hope to promote re the, the reproductive behavior. Know when to simulate the male previous to oviposition, that's important because uh, as we see in the graph, for example, this is a, an example. Let's say we have a male, and we already know what's the best hormone uh, working for the species. And we have two peaks, three hours and 30 hours post injection. And we know already uh, what, how the female responds and she will respond between the fifth and the sixth day after stimulation. So we will not um, simulate both the same day because we'll lose the window when the, the, the male will be producing the best concentrated and quality sample. What we'll do is we'll stimulate the, the female first and wait until the window that she's supposedly laying the eggs to simulate the male. So we can actually, <coughs> sorry, fit the production of the sample during the uh, oviposition of the female. Hold on. It is important to mention that we need to, um, understand the reproductive biology of the species. So we have, we have the best reproductive environment in captivity for them. This is very important. <coughs> so other factors that you need to watch for while you're doing this is considering, uh, for example, some reproductive behavior such as inflexes, and of course, uh, oviposition. So we, for different hormones and concentrations, you will want to measure the percentage of pairs that are in implexes or went into implexes compared to uh, the total of the stimulated pairs. And from those, how many laid eggs. And of course, after that, you will want to measure fertilization and probably well, how many of those developed into metamorphosis. 
So we, we've, we've been in the process of developing this for Crogaster Urbanesco, uh, Atelopus Diffus, Limosus, Certus, and Strabomantis buponiformis. So we have some success stories. Uh, this is for Strabomantis buponiformis. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a direct developing um, species. Usually uh, they bury the eggs uh, in, in the sand. There, uh, they take two months to, to hatch. And then they require a mix of river sand, dry leaves and gravel. Uh, we've noticed that even if they're stimulated and they don't have the correct environment, uh, they probably will not succeed in reproduction, in completing the reproduction process. They will lay the eggs all over the place and, or they will not go into implexus. So it's a combination between hormonal stimulation and having the right, right environment. So for these guys, uh, as you can see here, you can see the female, it's quite big. And you can tell there are some eggs here. It's not, it, this, this species is not translucent, so you cannot tell how many exactly. <laughs> but they went all the way to around 50 eggs and they are quite big, uh, uh, more or less one centimeter uh, in diameter. So they do go into implexus in the water and then they lay the eggs. Here you can see an embryo for, with two eggs, uh, two eyes, sorry, here. And then the little toadlets that uh, hatch from the eggs two months after simulation. Uh, same example with Crogaster Evanesco. Sorry, there is a mistake here. Should be Crogaster. Uh, then uh, these guys are terrestrial. Uh, they have a terrestrial reproduction as well, very similar to Sprabomantis. Uh, the only difference is that they take one month to develop. And again, these guys also require a mix of river sand, dry leaves, and gravel. And again, you can see here the female is down here, probably a little. And the male, the male uh, on top in a plexus, then they bury the eggs. And here we have the embryos and the little frogs. So another uh, application of, uh, or another art that also requires uh, hormonal simulation is artificial fertilization. So we have two methods, the in vitro, which is usually uh, carried out in petri dishes, as you see here, an example of the boreal to uh, artificial fertilization process, or by insemination for internal fertilization or <clears throat> internal fertilizing species such as some salamanders. Uh, this process is under development uh, at the moment. So you can either have hormonally induced gametes. Uh, and again, this requires an optimal pre-developed protocol. You can have gametes recovered from euthanized animals or recently deceased carcasses or frozen or cold stored sperm with fresh eggs. So the steps for in vitro, you will probably um, will be glad to have the, uh, the help of an ultrasound or you can have visual assessment of the female to see if she, uh, it's gravid enough or the eggs are mature enough. Then you proceed to uh, with the gamete collection. Uh, and if you're using frozen sperm, you go through the sperm thawing process and then you go and fertilize the eggs in vitro. For insemination, then again, you, you can use ultrasound or visual assessment of females from collection of following and insemination. So here you can see um, some experiments for uh, artificial fertilization in boreal toad. And here uh, for lithobacillus sevosa, some embryos fertilized via artificial fertilization. <clears throat> This is a simple process. Uh, probably what's complicated is it's what's behind. Uh, we'll have spermic urine or uh, after you, if you have uh, sperm recovered from testicular uh, or testicular sperm, you'll have uh, the dilution, the correct dilution that you want. And then you have the eggs in a Petri dish. And then you'll, uh, 
for some of, of the samples, sperm samples on top of the eggs. This can be either freshly collected eggs or um, eggs and, and the eggs. Uh, if you have a couple of hours in between the collection of the eggs and the thawing, for example, of the sperm, you can keep the eggs in ARS and fever and ring your solution until you go to, through the process. Then you wait uh, a couple of minutes and then you flood the Petri dish with water. And then you watch for uh, development. Here we have uh, an example of development, embryo, the embryonic development of L. cebosa after artificial fertilization with cryopreserved sperm. So from here, I leave you with Cecilia uh, and she'll be with you talking about genome resource banks. Okay, thanks, Gina. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, so the next section of the talk uh, will focus on um, cryopreservation uh, for building an amphibian genome resource bank or uh, GRB. Uh, so firstly, what is a GRB? Uh, well, they're frozen repositories in which materials such as germplasm or gamete, um, blood products, serum, tissue, and DNA can be maintained indefinitely at uh, cryogenic temperatures um, by storage in liquid nitrogen. Um, and GRBs are commonplace in medical and uh, clinical research, uh, such as for the preservation of important cell lines and animal model species for human diseases. And they're also widely used in agriculture and aquaculture industries for preservation of genetically valuable individuals for breeding. Um, in terms of conservation, um, GRBs, uh, along with the assisted reproductive technologies that Gina has been describing, um, can offer a valuable resource for amphibian conservation efforts. Uh, firstly, by providing a means to safeguard the genetic diversity of threatened populations, but they're also a highly useful tool in um, genetic management of captive survival insurance colonies um, in a number of different ways. Um, access to frozen gametes can facilitate uh, the exchange of genetic material between um, breeding populations, uh, thereby providing a means to increase genetic variability in captivity, um, minimize inbreeding without the need to introduce new individuals. Um, this also has a number of practical benefits in terms of relieving space issues um, in breeding facilities, because it allows you to uh, increase um, the genetics of a population without the need to increase your broodstock. And this also eliminates any um, quarantine or um, biosecurity issues associated with um, live animal exchanges and any animal welfare issues um, related to the transportation of live animals as well. Um, GRBs can also um, extend the genetic lifespan of an individual by um, preserving uh, genes across generations and thereby preserving a gene pool for future use. For example, if you uh, free sperm from founder or um, like wild born males, um, this sperm can be used in breeding efforts like several generations down the line and long after the individual has died as a way to restore genetics and minimize genetic drift and any potential adaptations to captivity. Um, and this is particularly important um, if we're talking about small populations and a lot of times in captive populations are small. And um, in terms of reintroduction efforts <clears throat> where the loss of important traits through several generations of breeding um, can result in a degeneration of offspring that have a reduced fitness on return to the wild, so can have um, consequences for reintroduction efforts. And uh, lastly, uh, GRBs um, provide a, a, a resource for genome security as an insurance um, against loss through um, disaster or disease. Um, but despite their inherent value to amphibian conservation, uh, only 41 of 500 species uh, recommended by Amphibian Arc have um, been banked down, uh, according to the most recent assessment um, in 2018. 
So with growing need for conservation of amphibians, there is a kind of urgent need to, to develop um, cryopreservation uh, protocols um, for a growing number of amphibian species. Um, next slide, please, Gina. Uh, so cryopreservation in amphibians uh, mostly focused on um, preservation of uh, the male line um, through uh, spermic urine or testes macerate suspensions. And uh, this is because the development of um, egg or embryo cryopreservation protocols is, is quite problematic uh, due to um, their large size, um, high uh, volume of internal water and the high lipid content of the yolk, um, and these can all um, interfere with the cryopreservation process. Um, similar issues exist in fish um, and efforts in fish egg embryo cryopreservation have been ongoing for I mean, over 30 years. And um, I, I, a successful cryopreservation protocol is yet to be developed. So for the moment, um, efforts uh, in amphibian cryopreservation uh, tend to be concentrated on, on sperm. Um, and traditionally um, in, um, in the literature, um, this involved euthanasia and extraction and maceration of testes. Um, however, you know, obviously this approach is not appropriate for endangered species or genetically valuable individuals. And now with um, the development of more and more successful um, hormone induction protocols, um, spermic urine is, is now the preferred uh, method for cryopreservation. Um, so in developing sperm cryopreservation protocols, um, a good first step is just to examine what's already out there in the literature and uh, you'll discover that uh, protocols tend to be quite highly species specific, um, which isn't surprising um, given the vast array of reproductive modes of amphibians and associated differences in um, morphological traits and um, embryonic development. Um, and so uh, this, um, sorry, the, yeah, so this is a highly variable um, motility recovery rates between species. And um, yeah, the, the, the general kind of measure of success in the literature tends to be um, in terms of recovery of sperm motility. And there's a, there's kind of lack of um, studies involving, um, uh, developmental outcomes such as you know, fertilization, embryonic development, and the production of reproductively um, viable offspring, uh, which means you know some people then might be a bit negative about these techniques, and and then, you know it really it requires validation in in the generation of um, of reproductively viable offspring. And so actually, the recent publication um, of the successful generation of uh, reproductively viable F1 generation in the green and golden bell frog um, is a major step in validating these cryopreservation techniques as a feasible means to restore reproductively competent individuals from frozen samples. And, and that was just published uh, this year. Uh, next slide, please, Tina. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is just a kind of a breakdown of the various steps that are necessary in, in developing um, a sperm cryopreservation protocol and several factors must be considered. Um, and there is a cryopreservation talk later in the webinar series and that will go into much more detail on this subject. Um, so I just really wanted to give you a brief kind of overview of uh, the processes involved and I've um, summarized the various steps along the way. So if we start with um, stage one and kind of pre-freeze pre stage, um, this uh, relies upon the successful development of a hormone stimulation protocol that uh, Gina detailed earlier if um, spermic urine is, um, is what you're, you're going to be freezing. Um, you can obviously freeze macerates um, from deceased males 
and there are methods for this as well. But um, depending on what you're using, um, the, the kind of processing is, is slightly different. Um, so for um, testes macerates, um, suspensions tend to be inactive and uh, spermic urine is, is a naturally activated state. So these require um, kind of different processing um, methods um, prior to cryopreservation. Um, so the cryopreservation process can have a, a hugely detrimental effect on sperm survival, and, and therefore it's, it's really important that high quality samples are obtained for cryopreservation, as you'll certainly lose a proportion of um, motility and viability during the freeze-thaw process. And again, uh, this is where you want to make sure that your hormone protocol is optimized um, to ensure that you've, you've got the best quality um, sperm sample for freezing. And so there's just a, a recommendation here where we kind of recommend that this to be above a million sperm per mil in quantity with motility and forward progressive motility, which is the proportion of, of motile sperm kind of moving, um, moving forward around 70% or higher. Um, it's also important to assess the sperm um, ahead of cryopreservation for um, any kind of um, morphological deformities in the head, tail, acrosome, any species um, with accessory structures, um, and the loss of which can affect motility. Um, and by doing this, this provides a much clearer idea of the effects of cryopreservation on the sperm cell. So if you already have a gauge of what the sperm looked like before freezing, then you have a greater understanding of the effects of um, different cryopreservation techniques. Um, so if we move on to stage two, um, this next step involves the um, freezing solution or cryoprotectin agent, which I just refer to as a, a CPA. Um, generally, CPAs can be divided into permeating and non-permeating. Um, permeating CPAs, uh, usually glycerols, um, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, and um, DMFA also commonly used. Um, these uh, work by entering the cell um, to minimize any um, intracellular ice formation. And non-permeating CPAs, um, which, which tend to be sugars such as sucrose and trehalose, and these can help prevent uh, damage during the thawing process. And, and commonly a combination of permeating and non-permeating CPAs are used. And it's really important in protocol development that you trial a number of different cryoprotectant agents in, and various different combinations and different concentrations in order to optimize um, your protocol. Um, and so cryo, cryotoxicity testing um, involves kind of putting these uh, cryoprotectant agents um, through a sort of um, a quality control, I suppose. Um, um, so by equilibrating or incubating the sperm sample in your chosen CPA um, for a number of different incubation periods without freezing, um, this can help you ascertain whether or not the CPA is, is toxic to the sperm. And if you just go ahead and put you know, sperm in CPA and then freeze, you're, it's not gonna be clear if any resulting damage is from toxic effects of the CPA or from the freezing process itself. So it's really important to extrapolate this. And um, the CPA addition rate is, is an important factor to consider in, in this stage of the process. Um, for some species, uh, dropwise addition um, might be best, um, where CPAs are gradually added to reduce osmotic shock. Um, but in other species, sperm are more resilient and with, can withstand um, the direct application of the CPA. And so after leaving the, the, cryoprotect the sperm in the cryoprotectant for um, different exposure times, um, you should then... Um, reactivate the sperm and then do another assessment of um, sperm motility and sperm morphological characteristics. And then this, once you've got this, the, the kind of best CPA and the most optimal, then you can proceed to stage three, which is the actual freezing and thawing process. Um, so firstly, 
you want to select um, the storage container. And these uh, tend to be either small vials or straws, generally straws, but vials can be used. Um, and for example, you know, it kind of depends on, on, your, on your storage facility. Um, some liquid nitrogen storage tanks are suitable for vials, whereas others are designed for straws. Um, and it's also really important that, um, particularly if you're using straws, that um, you take into consideration how to seal the straw. So um, plastic freezing straws can be um, sealed using a heat sealer, but you can also use um, plugs or um, you can use sealing powder. Um, I would recommend a heat sealer. Um, it just gives a better seal. Powder and plugs can pop off during thawing. And also sealing the straw tends to um, protect from a kind of minimized biosecurity issues, I suppose, within a liquid nitrogen tank. Um, and so once you've selected your um, freezing container, your vials, your straws, uh, then you want to consider the, the freezing mode. And so some facilities um, might have access to what's known as a, a programmable freezer, um, which can give a, a very exact and controlled freezing rate. Um, however, these are they're very expensive, um, and so it's it's not it's not probably not an option for a lot of facilities. So where there are economic constraints, um, there are some more cost effective ways to freeze sperm, um, such as a passive freezer. Um, this is simply putting samples into a minus 80 freezer, or you can use a charged um, dry shipper, which is also maintained at minus 80. Uh, but most economically of all, um, you can use a, a simple styrofoam box. I don't know, you might have noticed on the previous slide, there was a, a styrofoam box um, which had a sperm platform. Um, where the straws are suspended above liquid nitrogen um, for a period of you know, five to 10 minutes. And again, that's something else that can be played around with to optimize the protocol. And then these straws are plunged into liquid nitrogen. Um, vitrification, I've mentioned um, vitrification or rapid freezing is another cryopreservation method. And it's the most simple of all because you just plunge um, your sample directly into liquid nitrogen. Um, but this usually requires a much higher concentration of cryoprotectant solution. This can cause toxicity issues. Um, and to date, there, there's no like, real established um, technique for amphibian sperm vitrification, but I just wanted to mention it here as another um, potential cryopreservation method. Uh, so finally, uh, the last step in the process is, is thawing, and um, this can be, yeah, this is, this is equally as important as getting your freezing right in a way, because you, you may have optimized the whole process up until now, but if you can't efficiently thaw the sample, then it's, it's useless. So um, there are a couple of methods, um, so wet thawing, um, usually done um, by a water bath um, at various temperatures, and again, that's another factor that you can play around with and try and get right, um, and dry thawing is, is done simply by um, holding the sample in, in the air, and so yeah, uh, there's so many different ways to adjust your protocol. And so it's, it's very much a trial and error, unless you hit the jackpot straight away, it's very much a, a trial and error process, but by kind of extrapolating from the literature um, really helps to try and build, especially for um, species of um, the same taxa or um, similarly related species might um, cryopreserve, um, sorry, might, um, might have the similar characteristics and they might um, the same protocol might might be applicable. Um, but again, it's just a case of playing around and, and trying to optimize. And when you can use um, hormone stimulation protocols to collect sperm, then um, it's so useful because it gives you a, a kind of a 
sorry, it's very late here, <laughs> it give you a um, access to, to sperm in order to trial um, prior preservation protocols. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, please, Gina, thank you. Um, so for some species, um, the optimum prior preservation protocols um, that can be, be achieved might only recover a small percentage of motile sperm. Um, however, viability staining often determines that the, um, the proportion of, of live but immotile sperm is actually higher. And in situations like this, it might be useful to explore more advanced techniques for achieving fertilization, um, such as intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI, which is a more technically sophisticated uh, ART, uh, whereby the, the sperm or the sperm head is injected uh, directly into the cytoplasm of the egg, um, as shown in, in the picture there on the right. Um, and, and thereby you, you can circumvent any motility issues. And this technique, it's an effective treatment in human um, male infertility, and it is routinely employed in combination with IVF um, to achieve fertilization in uh, fertility clinics and in the medical research field uh, for mouse strains, which are sensitive to sperm cryopreservation. In terms of amphibians, uh, there are established ICSI techniques, um, which were um, first documented uh, um, decades ago in, in Xenopus levis. And it, it does remain an effective method for establishing transgenic Xenopus species um, in developmental research. And, and this is encouraging because ICSI would be highly advantageous in, um, in circumventing these motility issues associated with frozen thawed sperm. And it requires a much lower concentration of sperm as you only need one intact um, viable sperm per egg. And this would also be beneficial for smaller amphibian species that perhaps don't produce high volumes and concentrations of sperm, um, where you know artificial fertilization techniques might then result in, in, in low fertilization rates using the conventional methods. So these more advanced techniques might be useful um, for these situations. But to date, there, there are no studies on, on the use of of this technique of ICSI in amphibians for conservation purposes. And there are a number of drawbacks. And um, first, it, it, it is costly. <laughs> it requires pretty specialized equipment like um, this microscope here. Uh, this is a micro manipulator and they're not cheap. Um, and you also need the technical expertise to be able to use it. Um, it's also would be necessary to investigate any adverse genetic consequences resulting from um, the mechanical manipulation of eggs and the um, perpetuating subfertile sperm. So there, there's all sorts of issues there that would need to be considered. And, and lastly, I mean, ICSI requires the production of eggs. So you'd obviously need a, a hormone stimulation protocol in place before, um, before you could go ahead and use this technique, um, but it is important technology and it's worth mentioning um, and exploring its potential value in overcoming um, motility issues associated with sperm cryopreservation. Uh, next slide, please, Gina. Oh, yeah, so, so this webinar was just to give it a, a wide and, and general overview of the different arts available. But it's, it's important to reiterate that they should only be considered when all efforts have been made to produce natural mating through optimized husbandry protocols, you know, provision of species appropriate captive um, environment, nutritional requirements, um, and knowledge of the reproductive physiology of the species, hormone monitoring, ultrasound. And so only when these efforts have been exhausted, um, ART should be explored to, um, to assist in, in the following. 
circumstances. So where you have complete reproductive failure, either through lack of breeding behavior, no gamete production, or you have gamete production, but it's, it's asynchronous. Um, so hormone induction protocols um, should be attempted then to enhance breeding and optimize reproductive output. Um, hormone protocols are also highly valuable in providing us um, a means to obtain gametes um, in order to increase our, our knowledge of reproductive physiology of a given species, um, allows us to describe morphological characteristics of gametes, egg and sperm size and average sperm motility, tail structures, egg cycles. And we can do this now without having to sacrifice the animals. And it's also particularly useful in aquatic species where sperm collection um, is not really possible as it's released in large volumes of water. So overall, these techniques can allow us to gain a better understanding of, of cell biology and, and reproductive characteristics of species with different reproductive modes. Um, and arts such as um, hormone protocols can allow us to um, induce breeding behavior um, outside the breeding season and allows us to circumvent seasonally producing animals um, such as animals that undergo a period of um, brumation. Um, and they can also have health applications. Um, hormone induction can be utilized to help prevent instances of um, dystocia, egg retention, which is shown here in this unfortunate uh, Atilopus certus on the left here, on the right, sorry. Uh, this uh, dystocia is a common problem in, in captive amphibians. Um, where females are not naturally induced to release eggs and it can result in, in death of the female if, if it goes untreated. And so hormone uh, stimulation can have health applications in, in inducing spawning in, in these circumstances. And next slide, please, Gina. And uh, just to summarize the uh, arts such as sperm cryopreservation and biobanking, can be advantageous to captive survival insurance colonies by um, facilitating genetic management um, and in several ways. And, and I went into detail about these earlier. So I'll just briefly summarize here. Um, and they allow us to minimize inbreeding through sperm cryopreservation, genetic exchange, introduce genes of uh, valuable dead animals um, back into the population. So those held in GRBs um, can be used to restore genetics to a population. Um, it allows us to introduce um, new genes such as from other uh, populations, uh, which could be um, captive or wild um, and thereby increasing genetic variability. And uh, the, there will be a talk later in, in the series, I believe, um, about wild sperm uh, collections. Um, and, and finally, in terms of genetic management, um, <clears throat> um, the preservation of valuable genes as a genetic in insurance policy by banking down as many species as we can in a, in a GRB. Um, in terms of um, other applications, um, well, they can help, ARTs can be used to help save space in breeding facilities. So more and more amphibian populations require captive breeding programs, spaces at a premium. So being able to reduce the brood stock through cryopreservation um, and genetic exchange is, is be highly beneficial to captive breeding um, facilities. And uh, as I mentioned um, earlier, um, arts like cryopreservation um, are useful in minimizing um, disease and animal welfare issues associated with the transportation of, of live animals. So it just removes all those problems if you can ship a, a vial of sperm between breeding facilities. Uh, next slide, please, Tina. Uh, we'd like to end on a very happy note um, with uh, an example of um, successful application of uh, all four arts in uh, critically endangered species. This is the, the Mississippi or dusky gopher frog. 
So in the wild, there's less than a couple of hundred individuals and um, using a combination of arts, so hormonally induced spermic urine, hormonally induced eggs, uh, sperm cryopreservation and artificial fertilization. Um, hundreds of offspring um, were generated. And I think this is a nice illustration of um, proof of concept that these techniques can and do work. Um, uh, next slide, please, Gina. So um, thank you all for listening to our talk today. Um, please feel free to contact any of us with any questions you might have. Uh, on the following email addresses there. And we kindly ask you um, just take a few moments of your time to fill in the questionnaire um, on the link below. I think Nat's going to make it available in the chat. And this is for the ASG IUCN Arts and Biobanking Working Group. Um, so if you have any interest in amphibian arts, please feel free to fill out that questionnaire.